you have tonight sitting with you, before I do a brief intro, just, just for you guys to understand this, is that between the four of us, we've collectively closed over 10,000 real estate transactions. So if you're a new real estate investor, or even a seasoned real estate investor, now is a fantastic opportunity for you to ask pretty much anything you want. There's no presentation, there's no PowerPoint, we're not selling anything, it's just an open Q&A for you to ask us anything you want about wholesaling, fixing, flipping, pretty much anything related to real estate. All right, so let me go ahead and make a quick introduction. So first up is Kevin Thatcher, who's the founder and CEO of Independent Cyber. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Are you all excited? Yeah. I hope you're excited because it's hot in here. And if you're going to be like this, we're going to probably end it early, right? We want, to, we want to make sure we get some excitement in the room. So as Lex said, my name is Kevin Thatcher. I'm the owner of a local title company, very investor friendly. We've been open for 17 years. We've closed over 10,000 deals. We're very investor friendly. So ask whatever questions you have. My only rule is the advice I give you. I'm not an attorney. You want to ask the legal questions to the attorney, the tax questions to the accountant, uh, but I'm definitely here to be a resource for you. You know, in closing over 10,000 deals, we've seen just about everything. We've dealt with it. Everything from wire fraud to real estate fraud to home stealing scams to land trusts. I mean, you name it, we've probably seen it. So I welcome any questions you have. Uh, and then also tonight, we're gonna to give away three items. So we have the bottle of wine as well as a couple of books, you get your pick. So the first winner will get their choice of either the wine and then we have a bunch of books you can pick from as well. You just have to text in, all right? So you wanna write down this number, you text the word title, T-I-T-L-E, to 31996 and at eight o'clock it's gonna pick. So you have to stay till eight and it's gonna pick some winners for you. So we're gonna have three winners out of the room. Normally we only do one. So if, if you have any questions or it's not working, just see Dave in the back of the room. Got it? Awesome. Okay, nicely done. How about a round of applause for our panelists, so Kevin Tapcho and Kevin Tapcho. All right, so I'll give you guys a brief intro. I'm the person that runs this real estate investment club. Uh, my name is Lex Levenrad. We have monthly meetings on the first Tuesday of every month. We have a uh, Distressed Real Estate Investors Association. That's what that's called and also run a company called the Distressed Real Estate Institute, which teaches new investors how to wholesale and fix and flip properties. All right, so next up is Mr. Jim Van Dyke with Wholesale Cash Deals. There we go. JVD Properties. JVD Properties, and uh, nicknamed me, what, Jimmy the Wholesaler? Jimmy Many the wholesaler. years ago? Yeah, yeah. If anybody knows, doesn't know me, Jim Van Dyke, I've been wholesaling down here since 2001. Um, like Kevin, he's seen all sorts of deals, and I've seen all sorts of deals, crazy deals. Um, Please, any question, not off limits, small basic question, but any question on wholesaling, please ask me. If it's about rehabbing, ask these two guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. <laughs> uh, next up is David Dweck, also affectionately known as Mr. Double D, and he's the uh, founder of the Book of Real Estate Investment Club, which has been running for around uh, 22 Five. years, Five. 25 Five. years. Five. And also uh, the founder of private equity Thank funding. You. So how about a round of applause for David? Thank you, Lex. Good evening. Great to be here. And uh, you know, we uh, Lex and I have uh, something in common, and that is that uh, we uh, we shine it up every day. Um, he was a little bit challenged, you know, not only phonically with his brain cells just a moment ago. So I suggest you make a line. That's Italian for cheers. Um, so. Well, First, you know, let's see how know, sharp. As far as that's concerned, you know, Excuse my me, father said. <laughs> yes, you're saying. You grass, too. grass does not grow on a busy highway. First of all, we're in America, not Oklahoma. It's grass. Okay, you don't take a bath, you take a bath. You don't wear a swimming costume. You wear a freaking bathing suit. Okay. I'm from Brooklyn, pal. Okay. <laughs> I know we got that straight Beat it right up away. the way. It's All right. Holiday. So now, first, I want to make sure everybody's alive and well, okay? And paying attention. Thank you very much, Deb. That was good. Now, somebody's going to finish the rest of the line, and then you're going to get a prize. You give me the rest of the line to the song. It's getting hot in here. Come here. All right, come here. So let's do that again. It's getting hot in here. So take off all your clothes. That's a different meeting. Keep your clothes on. Keep your clothes on. Here's your first million. All right? Here's a million bucks for you. There you go. 
Anyway, I'm, uh, I've been in real estate for uh, just about 30 years. I got uh, I was an investor first, got my real estate license in 90, 1993. I've been doing hard money loans for almost 20 years, uh, thousands of deals, and uh, I enjoy what I do very much. And my most recent venture, we did a Facebook Live today. Anything off limits tonight? Uh, nope. So we're brainstorming at my space in called Desk Suites in Margate. That I just opened up June first. I didn't do my grand opening yet. We did a uh, video today, and we brainstormed. Um, and the person I was with is a realtor, and full time she's an ER nurse. And she said, "What? Well, you know, every day in the ER I see a shit show." So I said, "Why don't you do no shit show real estate?" So sh today we shut on GoDaddy on our Facebook Live and incorporated or and see, it's funny. You have a gimmick. She has a gimmick now. No shit show real estate. It's good stuff. Anyway, that's my story. <laughs> okay, right. so now, Kevin, the video, we cannot put that on iTunes. If we do, you got to put the explicit category. All right. How about a round of applause for David? All right, so let's just go ahead and dive right into it. So uh, if you have cards with questions on them, just go ahead and drop them right over here in front of me, and we're just going to go through them. So. Uh, if you have a question and you don't yet have it on a card and you want to raise your hand, go ahead and ask the question. I'm going to repeat the question for the camera and then we'll go ahead and take slides. Okay, yes, the and the, the rest of you, before we take this question, the rest of you have index cards. So if you have a question, write it down on the card and then our staff members will be coming in and dropping it off in the front of the room. I suggest you guys come on the outskirts so we don't knock that camera. Um, and just go ahead and drop them right over here. We'll go ahead and ask them. Okay, first question. First question is for wholesaling. Hi, Jenny. Hi. It's good for you. Um, I'm new to real estate and I'm looking to get into wholesaling. So, what are some beginning steps that I need to start research first? Or what is the, the boot camp or the groundwork for understanding wholesaling? And then moving to the next level? Yeah, just what are the first okay. steps for getting into wholesaling? Basically, yeah. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, sounds corny, but come to meetings like this. Educate yourself as much as you can. Find a mentor, okay? Find a mentor. You run a boot, Lex runs a boot camp. David runs a boot camp. It's just more knowledge you can get. That's just information. Um, down here in South Florida, what I think is really important is know your neighborhoods. Know, know the properties. I spent the first, yeah, I've been doing this in 2001. But I literally drove the streets of South Florida for 13 or 14 years. I am not kidding you. I, was doing, I don't need a GPS. I know where to go. It's down in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade County. Just know your neighborhoods. Uh, become friends with other wholesalers. When you start out, other wholesalers are going to be your very best friend, for sure. If anything else you can add? I mean, Okay, very nice. So we've got a bunch of questions coming in over here. No, I don't feel, I don't feel like I really needed to add anything to that. I think there was a pretty uh, all-encompassing okay, response. Nice. i got about nine questions already here in front of me, so we're just going to try to get through these. Okay, so the next question that I have is how to comp a wood frame house in a predominantly CBS neighborhood. David, do you want to take a gander at this one? Sure. So. How many of you, first I'll, ask, I'll answer that question with a question. How many of you are in fear of wood frame houses? There's always at least one. So I'm gonna tell you something. There are many, in, in, especially in Palm Beach and Miami-Dade County, not so much in Broward, but I saw one last week, I think it was around Hollywood, or East Fort Lauderdale, houses that were built in the 20s, old Spanish style houses, mission style houses, that are wood frame. I grew up in a wood frame house in New York. That house is over 100 years old. They have nor'easters, they have storms in New York. Wood frame houses breathe. I own wood frame rentals. I have no problem with wood frame homes. Um, now, where you could have a problem would be if, the, you know, if there's severe, severe termite or structural damage. That's another story whatsoever. But if there are wood frame homes in the neighborhood. Um, I do the same comp. In fact, I'm just going to share a story because uh, it was Yossi and Alana's first house. I wholesaled it to them, the one in Papa. That was a quote, manufactured home. But I didn't feel it was a manufactured home. I felt it was a wood frame home. 
and I got Broward County to change it to single family as opposed to modular, and they changed it. Now there's ways of learning how to um, uh, beat the system, but that's where you need a professional to uh, to help you, whether it's a realtor who knows how to properly list and sell your home. Let me back that up. I, investors are generally afraid of wood frame houses or frame stucco. You sold me one back in 2000, you and Craig sold me one back in 2001. And I had it as a great rental and I sold it and somebody burned it down, but that's- El Prado. El Prado. I and remember. Then I, then I resold it again. I remember. That was fun. Um, you made a lot of money on that house. I did make a lot of money. I made some money on that house. Twice. But no, you know, those houses have been there. The house was built in 1927, 1928. It's still there. Did you ever have a problem with that house? No. No. It, really, it's a mindset. It, it is. Stinking thinking. Was that first house of yours in Poplar? Was that a wood frame house? No. no. Okay. Um, again, I have no problem with wood frame houses. Now, you, now, the other thing I'll tell you, this happened right here in Boca in the house I was buying on Camino Real. And I look at, and this is a CVS house, and I look at the door jam. One of the door jam was full of termite like pot marks. So all you have to do is stick a pen, and if, and if you're making a lot of holes, there's problems. I said to the, uh, who's listed, I said to the realtor, is there a ladder in the garage? And he said, yes. I went into the crawl space. Uh, that was before light, the phones had lights, smartphones had lights. I always had a flashlight in my truck. And I shined a flashlight into the trusses of this home. And the trusses were so termite-eaten the trusses looked like toothpicks. And I disclosed to the realtor, you have a big problem up there. Now that's not just a roof, folks. That's where you have to hire an engineer. You have to retrust the house. So your twelve, fifteen thousand dollar roof job now becomes twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, maybe forty, because you have to re roof and retrust the whole house. That's a different story. That's a CBS house. Okay, so next stop, uh, which one are we doing, Kevin? This one? Okay, so the question is, example of a discussion or amendment to a contract the property doesn't sell during the initial contract time frame? So, a lot of times, well, the first thing, for, for especially for the newbies, to understand what wholesaling is. So this is kind of talking a little bit about wholesaling, which is the process of you buying a house and selling it at the same time, right? So you're going to buy it today, sell it today, and make a profit in the middle. So you may buy it for 60000 sell it for 70000 and make $10,000 less closing costs. So that's the process of wholesaling. When we talk about getting deals under contract, you have to realize that you need to make sure you have a way out, right? You need an exit strategy. So before you get in, I always say, make sure you understand how you're gonna get out. Because a lot of problems we see are clients are getting into these deals and then they miss their inspection period and they have no way to get out if they don't sell it. So the whole idea with wholesaling is you're gonna get into a deal, let's say, you enter a contract today for 60,000 and you're gonna wind up trying to find a buyer that's gonna close. And you need to find a buyer that is going to put their deposit up and they're gonna close with no inspection period or at least an inspection period less than yours. Because typically your inspection period is your only way out. Okay, so we're talking about if a property doesn't sell, you know, you, you need to be proactive, right? If, if a property doesn't sell within your inspection period, you need to do an addendum to the contract extending your inspection period or you'll have to cancel your contract. Because once your inspection period goes uh, past the, the 10 or 15 days, your money that you have in escrow now goes hard and you could technically lose that money if you choose not to close, okay? So during that initial, does everyone understand that? So during that initial time frame, you have those 10 or 15 days for your inspection period to find a buyer. And if you don't find a buyer, you need to either do what? Cancel the contract or extend your inspection period. Tell them, oh, you know, I, I'm waiting for my partner to review it. You, you try and come up with any ideas that you can in order to get them to maybe give you an extra five days. But I always tell wholesalers as well, is most wholesalers aren't going to be able to find the deal and find the buyer. It's very, very difficult. So as soon as you get a deal under contract, you need to start working with the three of these gentlemen up here because they're able to find the buyers, right? So understand that process of making sure how you're able to get your deal under contract and then you're able to sell it hopefully before that inspection period 
comes up. And then when we talk about deposits, you want to make sure you get a deposit greater than what you put up. So if you put up $1,000, have your buyer put up $5,000. So you always have more to fall back on. So if you claim, if you lose your deposit and you claim your buyer's deposit, you claim five grand, you may lose a thousand or two and you make that little bit of spread and, and hopefully you'll find another buyer. Did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I do have. That was my question, but it was directed really specifically to the wholesalers of what, what their deposit normally is that they request when they find a property and what their experience is when it doesn't sell after 30 days or whatever. That's you mean after they put the deposit up? Right, right. Well, first of all, what, what was what your usual deposit that you put? I usually, I usually say 5000 okay. with a shorter inspection period than longer. Like what? what I try to get, I try to do three, three days. Because, I mean, most, a lot of people put offers in, they'll put a thousand dollars, they'll put a thousand dollars on the contract, they'll put a 15 or 14 day inspection period. Well, if somebody does that and offers a hundred, and I offer a hundred, and I've got three days and five thousand dollars up, which offer they're going to take? Even if I'm a little lower, they're probably going to take my offer. And being a wholesaler, I know within two or three days if that thing's going to sell anyway. If it's if it's hanging out there for ten days, it's not going to sell. So, so, so after the after that period, it's like you don't get any, you don't get a good response, or you just get I, yeah. I put a list out every day. Who gets my list? I put a list every every single day. After two or three days, if I get like one call or no calls, gone. But it's, it's not, it's not moving off to 72 it's not hours. Move. It's not I mean, our, our buyers, like you, they're professionals. They look at a house, they say, that's a deal, or they go, no, that's not a deal. You want to add to that, David? So on a uh, negotiation on the house that I don't think I'm going to get, <clears throat> and I let the realtor keep both sides of the commission, and I offer my highest and best zero day inspection period. Uh, very familiar with the neighborhood, very familiar with the house, and uh, I've done business with a particular realtor before. Um, but I'm not going to pay stupid money. Now, second part of that question would be, um, if I'm putting up a $5,000 deposit, and um, let's say I'm putting it up, at, and this is actually a deal happening right now, we just have a little bit of a wrinkle in it. But I put up, I think, a $5,000 deposit on the property I'm buying in Miami Gardens. It's been flipped. Um, now, typically, because I flipped it with Jim, Jim knows the buyer, okay? So I didn't use this rule I'm about to share with you that I do, and I teach it this way. So, Hassan, I did it Okay, Hassan seems like a very nice guy. He's interested now in the house that, I'm, that I've got under contract with a $5,000 deposit in Kevin. Now, I don't know him. But he seems okay, he seems to be a cash buyer. Great, I'm gonna make him give me at least $7,000 and he's not gonna put that up in escrow, he's gonna give it, he's gonna pay my company. Why? Because if he defaults, I don't wanna have to go to Kevin and make a demand for it and have to squabble. I just want, I'll let, I'm letting him know, dude, you know, you walk, your money's gone. And I'm very upfront about that. Look, I deal in reality, not theory. And that's a real deal. Now, do you, that's not the only problem doing that. If you're up front and straightforward, you're going to do business. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. What are your top five ways to locate distressed properties? Driving for dollars, mailings, what filter from lead software, etc. All right. So my top ways for finding properties would be driving for dollars, and I use the Deal Machine app for that. So the little app you can download on your phone and you can send postcards out. But also, probably I would say my best deals with the biggest spreads are the ones where I wasn't looking for them. They went on the MLS. I just happened to be going to a property and I came around the corner and I saw a vacant boarded up house. I looked it up, sent them a letter or a postcard and landed up buying the house. A lot of times, if I see someone close by, I'll ask them, hey, what's the deal with this house? And they'll tell me, oh, that lady died three months ago. And I'll say, do you know, you have any relatives, phone numbers? And I'll just call them up and say, hey, interested in selling this house. That, that's worked out pretty well. Another method is just mailing postcards. Uh, postcards are pretty inexpensive. You can send postcards out for around 50 cents to as low as 32 cents if you send them out in, in quantity. Uh, so we send out about 2,500 postcards a week, about 10,000 a month consistently to just specific lists. And then in addition to that, we choose a bunch of other lists, specialized lists like probate, inheritance, and uh, 
tax delinquents, uh, code enforcement, fire damage. Uh, we've got 17 different lists, but basically, if you want to consistently have postcards going out, you're going to get a response rate of about three quarters of 1%. So for every thousand cards you send out, you'll probably get seven or eight calls, and you should be able to get one or two appointments to meet a homeowner. Um, so anyone want to add to that? How many times do you need to send to the same address? So we this like to kid. send six times consecutively, so we'll mail once a month for six months, and then we'll stop that list and, and do a, a different list. So that's another thing as well that Jim pointed out, a lot of beginners will mail one time and stop. But the people who keep mailing, keep mailing, when the, the seller might have 10 cards, but they land up calling the one that mailed in more, for whatever reason. Because sometimes you send them a card and they don't want it right now, they throw it in the trash. And then a month later you send them a card, they throw it in the trash too. And then the following month, something happens, they lose a job and they go into foreclosure and then they have that card and because you mailed again on the third time they call you and not your competitors to stop mailing. Uh, so, so postcards always work well and then um, banner signs, probably the lowest cost point of entry for myself and also many people that I know and including students of mine just paying two dollars for a banner sign and buying a hundred banner signs is two hundred dollars, very low barrier to entry. Say we buy houses for cash, just kind of like that sign over there and if somebody calls, they're probably interested in selling the house, right? So that's a pretty good way to go. And then finally, I'd say, nice. yes. What's that? Burner phone. Burner phone, right? Okay, good point. So make sure you're not using your own cell phone number or your work phone number on your bandit sign. Make sure you're using something like a call rail or a burner phone or something that doesn't come back to you if you're going to be putting bandit signs out. And then finally, I'd say. Uh, Facebook ads, so what you can do with Facebook ads, it's really useful, is you can buy one of these lists, like let's say for example, uh, the big, big list like an absentee list, and then you can upload it as a custom audience to Facebook, and then you can make a custom ad and you can run it to that audience. So it can be very good because of the geographic advertising things that they have inside Facebook. So let's say you buy, for example, all the absentee homeowners in, in Pompano Beach, and then you make an ad to sell your house in Pompano Beach for cash, and then you just run that ad to everybody that lives in Pompano Beach and that owns a home and doesn't live in a rental. So there's a little bit of behind the scenes programming to get that data together, but once you get it together, it's very, very um, on topic and very, very focused. And you tend to get a lead for a lot less than you would out of something like uh, Postcard. Okay, so um, you gonna go ahead and read sure. your question? Sure. Uh, this can be, Done two ways. How do you calculate your offer price to distressed owners? Okay, I'll play in a wholesaler's or wholesaler sense. You can maybe do it in a fix and flip, but in a wholesaler, I tell people, you know, people say, "What should I offer as an investor?" I said, "Offers. Your offer is contingent upon what you can sell it for." Okay, it doesn't have anything to do with the list price, asking price. Um, if I can, see, if, a, if some house is listed for let's say 150,000, and I look at it and I go, mm, I can sell that for 140. Well, I'm going to be making an offer around 130, maybe a little over, to try to get it. If it's listed for 150, and I think, oh my God, I can sell that for 180, I'm going to list. I'm going to, I'm going to go over asking with a short, super short inspection period. So, how, how do you calculate your offer to distress in wholesaling? It's totally contingent upon what you can sell it for. Different areas are different. Are different. Uh, that's pretty stupid. Some areas, <laughs> some areas are rental areas. Some areas are fix and flip. You go to an area like Lauderdale Manor down in Fort Lauderdale, or some areas in Pompano, where there kind of is no retail number. It's all rentals. So it's really what's your return on investment. Then you go to some places in Margate and Coral Springs. It's totally different because they're more fix and flips. So once again. Your offer is contingent upon what you can get rid of it, and how do you know how much you can get rid of it? Get every wholesaler's list you can possibly get, and you're going to eventually learn your numbers. And it's all a numbers game, 100%. Retail? Well, I'm going to give it to you from a wholesale and a retail perspective. When I'm, when I'm dealing with a seller, uh, you, you want to be the last person to give out a number. And I learned from the great real estate godfather, Pete Fortunato. If you don't know who he is, you need to look him up. Um, but Pete asked this great question. What do you need? What do you need? Well, it's, it's funny, you know, it's funny because I belong to this mastermind. And so 
I just came back from San Diego about a week and a half ago, and we were sitting at a table, and it just so happened that at that table there were a bunch of guys that were about my age group that all started real estate around the early 2000s. And so one of the guys who runs a mastermind came over and says, what is this like Jimmy Napier, Pete Fortunato table, right? Because we were all these like, let's say more old timers in the industry. And then there's this different group of people that are this young, like under 30 group that are very technologically oriented. But sometimes a lot of the young people that are entering the business don't really understand the basics of the business. So what David just said over there, you know, right now we're in a really strong market and everyone's getting into wholesaling, but when the market turns, probably 50 to 75% of those people are gonna be flushed out. But at the end of the day, knowing when a seller calls you to be able to just go to them and say, look, I really wanna buy a house, what do, we do? what do we need to do to make this happen? In other words, in learning how to structure a deal and learning how to put seller financing and learning how to do different things to get a deal done where every other wholesaler would just walk away and say, I can't make money out of this deal, right? So it's very, very important. And some of the, the best real estate writers and educators, I think, are in the, the pre-real estate guru days. They, they were back in the 70s, I guess, right? Would you say 70s? And they just put some amazing material out there. So if you guys can go out there and buy their stuff on, on eBay or Amazon, read it because it's just really good, rock solid. These guys educated from way before there were coaching programs and stuff to sell. They just educated based on their own experience and it's good stuff out there. Like, All right. Sorry, like, yes. Like who? Who okay, so there's, there's, there's um, Jimmy Napier, there's um, Jack Miller, uh, Pete Fortunato, uh, Jack, John Schwab, uh, Schaub. Schaub, who else is there? I mean, those are probably four of the really good names. Like, and there's a lot of specialists in certain areas. Like, if you wanted to learn mobile home parks, like some of the Ronnie Scrooge stuff, and there's certain specific. Lonnie. What's it? You said Ronnie. Lonnie. Lonnie. Lonnie Scrooge. Yeah. So he's and he's deceased now. A lot of these guys. There's a couple of guys that have moved on. What's the other guy that? Ernie Kessler. Right. Ernie Lonnie, Kessler Lonnie passed Stick. away. There's a couple of guys that have really passed away, but um, their, their materials were very, very, very good. Okay. Next up, Kevin. All right, so two questions. This one was, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit. It says, give an example of a contract you use to hold property during your marketing. So we talked about that, what wholesaling is. I don't know who asked the question, but it talks about like deposit inspection period. So it depends on what side of the deal you're on. But if you're the wholesaler getting a deal under contract, you want the larger or the smaller deposit? You want the smallest deposit and the longest or shortest inspection period, right? So that's basically when you're getting a deal under contract, you first have to meet the needs of the seller. You want to get the least amount down in escrow, and then you want to have the longest inspection period because it's going to give you the least exposure and it's going to give you the longest time to find a buyer. Does that answer that question? Okay. And then the other one kind of falls. And now also, you know, one of the questions people ask, you know, example of a contract, stick with the far bar contract, the as is far bar contract. Just stick with it. You take all of these guru courses and they talk about this one page contract and this contract and that contract. The only downside that I have ever seen and, and the largest investors that do thousands of deals are using the far bar as his contract. The only downside to remember with that contract is you can't record any part of it in public record. So if your strategy is going to be to tie up that seller's property with the memorandum of contract, you need to use a different type of contract. But other than that, that contract will protect both sides. It's a very good contract if it needs to be litigated. And I always tell people that it's only a problem when? When it's a problem, right? So you only need to litigate the contract. So you're gonna need that contract only when there's a problem. You can write a contract on a piece of paper between you and the seller and if all goes well, it'll work. Right? We just need something in writing. You know, I agree to buy your property for X amount with the deposit. And, and it'll work. But when there's a problem, there's nowhere to go back to in order to litigate it. And the second part talks about a contract when there's a deceased seller. So a lot of times you're going to check, you know, I did a, a video. We have a uh, YouTube series with, I think, about 180 uh, YouTube videos. You can check it out on our website, which is uh, title rate, R -A -T -E, title R-A-T-E, titlerate.com. And there's a link to the YouTube on there and just subscribe to it. And, and we did a video on this where we talk about what most agents put as the seller. Does anyone know what that is? Do you, if you've owner seen contracts, of record. owner of record, right? A lot of people just put owner of record because it covers it every which way. And I always tell people, don't do that. Go the extra step to try and find out who owns the property. Check the property appraiser. 
which then would lead to this question that was asked about what do you do if the deceased seller is still on title? Well, who are you talking to if they're dead? Right? I mean, think about it. Who are you talking to? You need to ask the questions. Oh, so, so you know, who are you in connection to the person that passed away? Now, remember, they passed away, so be careful, because it could be their mother, their father, their grandparent. You need to be careful. It's a sensitive topic. But you can make the most amount of money dealing with estate sales. So you need to ask the question, who are you? Was probate done? Are you the personal representative? Are you maybe the heir to the estate? Most people do not understand. They think, oh, mom and dad owned a house, mom and dad passed away, and now the children own it. It doesn't work that way. There's a process that has to be followed. So you have to do a little bit of research, and if you have questions, you can always direct them to us uh, where we can talk to them and try and just ask a couple of questions. If you ask the questions now, you're not gonna find yourself, and, and here's where you'll have a problem. You're gonna find yourself in, in two months from now realizing that the person who didn't have the right to sign the contract signed the contract. And now you have what? No contract. You have nothing, right? So do a little bit of homework now and find out. Are you the heir to the estate? Are you a personal representative? Has probate been done? Is there a will? And you can ask a lot of these questions that will give us the answers where we can tell them, oh, this is what you need to do. You need to do, there's certain types of probate. Some are super long, some aren't as long. If the, if the probate was done in another state, it could be uh, much faster, a much faster process. So it really just depends at what stage it's in. But just don't put owner of record or don't put the person that you're meeting with. Ask the questions and say, who are you? And then as a default, what you would put is the estate of. The person can sign as personal representative and you just put the estate of the person that passed away and that'll cover it for the first page of the contract. And then they can sign their name on the last page and then put, you know, personal representative, trustee, uh, you know, whatever whatever they are, you know, whatever they're uh, appointed as. But the heir most likely doesn't have the right to sign. They need to find out who that personal representative is gonna be. Sometimes it's, it's one of the two heirs or, or you know, one of the three heirs, maybe one of the siblings, but very important. I have a question to that. So do you have to wait for the yeah, so it's a good question. So if we're going through a probate process, uh, you'll have to wait obviously until probate is completed because that person is gonna have to be appointed as the personal representative. So it'll go through the probate process. We'll get a court order from the court that'll say, uh, you know, you have the authority to sign on behalf of the estate and then we would be able to sign. Because what's gonna happen is we're gonna determine whether the personal representative is the sole person to sign or we may require the heirs to sign as well. So it could be, you know, you're a cousin that was appointed personal representative and there's two children that have to sign. Uh, you know, because maybe it was a homestead property of the person that passed away, which means then the children have rights to that property. So, you know, it really depends on that process, but yes, you would have to wait until, not to get it under contract, but you will have to wait until that probate process is complete in order to finish the sale. Okay. Uh, David, you have a question over there? Sure. This reading is uh, almost as bad as mine. How much effort do you spend to know the rehab costs when wholesaling? That's the first part. So I'm going to tell you that, um, and this is not to bash wholesalers, but wholesalers typically under price the rehab costs. Uh, folks, it's not the material that's expensive, it's the labor. And um, a couple of people in the room have just have seen a rehab on about to uh, on the market in Boca, and I under budgeted, um, and not just by a little, but by a lot. And, you know, it's not a big house in Boca; it's uh, just under sixteen hundred square feet. Um, but I'll give you an idea of where I screwed up. Um, one of them were was the the electrical and permitting in Boca Raton is just hellish. I was going to enclose the car for when I found out it's going to take me 120 days for a $12,000 garage. I said, forget it. I'll leave it as carport. And then I had, um, uh, have you seen the price of sod lately? <laughs> Try sodding a big lot. Over budget. Um, these were plaster walls. You know how much it, 
How much do you think it'll cost to skim coat ceilings and walls, watch this, in a 1,500 square foot house, a three bedroom, two bath house, skim coating all the walls inside that were plastered so they're not smooth. Any ideas? My condo, it's a fortune. How much what? How much I what? don't know, it's just a lot. <laughs> it's Any just ideas? a lot. At least. I didn't expect it to be that. I budgeted four. These guys spent, uh, it would be out. It's, they spent probably, I think it was five days in a lot of material to do the ceilings on stilts, the whole nine yards. So, um, I, I always have a fudge factor. So it's safe to add 10%. So if your rehab is gonna be $20,000, add two grand, okay? As a fudge factor, just have a fudge factor. Next part of the question is how would you position to wholesale a house where the owner owes $180,000, the house retails for $200,000, owner will sell for what they owe the bank of one hundred eighty. There's no deal there, except, here's the deal. That's not a, that's not a cash deal. It's not something I have to buy financing for. You know, if the house is worth two hundred, dollars what do you have to buy for it flips? How much? <coughs> what? No, how much? Come on, sixty-five percent. Come on, somebody. It's worth one. If it's worth two hundred, what do you? What's your maximum buy? One thirty. Keith, come on up. Keith got it. One thirty. Okay. Let me give you. Um, hang on. Here's a million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a dream big card? Do you have a dream big card? Here's a dream big card. Okay. So now, but here's the creative way to do that. Now, on that 180, you find out what their PITI is. And, okay, who's got a financial calculator, a quick calculator, do a little amortization? Somebody? Thank you. Let's take 180 at, let's just say it's at 5% and amortize it to give me an amortization payment. Please. Yeah. So just go through the exercise, we'll get a little creative. While he's doing that, let's just assume that the taxes for this are no more than, tax insurance no more than 500 a month. So let's just budget that 500, what's the PI? 966 plus 500, let's just say it's 1450. The question is, can you rent this house for $1,800, If the answer is yes, will you do the property subject to? So then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take it subject to that, that mortgage, okay? And if it needs work, hopefully it's just fresh coat of paint, something very light. Then it could be a deal. You're looking at structuring the deal in a different way. Um, everybody get that? Okay. Do so you want me to do another one while I got it? Sure. Okay. Uh, good question. What are you using to track uh, software and spreadsheets to track rentals? Who asked this question? I did. Phil. Um, okay. And how do you track expenses for flips? Um, Excel is your friend there. It's all Excel. You can customize Excel. Anybody here a bookkeeper or a CPA? Liz. Liz. Am I right? Yeah. There's your answer. Now. Go to MrLandlord.com and you can probably get some other things, that, that, but it's all Excel for me. For, what was that? Well, is Excel old fashioned? Yeah. I mean, I guess now it's considered old fashioned. Phil, didn't, didn't you go to Mr. Landlord's? I, I did, I was actually there this last month. And yeah, didn't he have a good resource for you on that? I was, I was just asking what you guys Oh, I see, okay. It was really for you guys just to, Curious as to what you guys were using to track. A lot of people use Excel. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was using. I was using that. I was using QuickBooks. Yeah. Uh, they have their own software. They have some stuff that's online. You can just put your numbers in and it tracks and does other things for you. Yeah. Um, okay. You have a question over there, Jimmy? Sure. Oh my gosh, it's not read it yet. When you have a seven day or a 15 day inspection period, this is the time to market to cash buyers and wholesaling. But do you also get an inspector to come out and inspect the property? No, never. Because my buyer is going to be the one doing the inspecting. They're inspecting. I'm 
there's no reason for me to spend money, effort, to get an inspection to tell the buyer what's wrong with the house. That's their responsibility. For, seriously, to figure out what's wrong. And go along with what you did. I never give price, I never give repair estimates, me. You're right. Now, the other thing that has to happen is if Jim gets an inspection, now he has to disclose. Oh, so right. he is covering his assets. You understand? Now, I'm gonna tell you a negotiation. I just did this and I am now my buyer's heroes. I have a retired New York attorney and his composer wife who's a conductor and their fellow Rotarians, our Rotary group meets here Wednesday every, uh, every week. And this particular home was listed for above 700 and we, I wasn't gonna let them pay that. So I made an offer below 700, subject to inspection, as is, subject to inspection. And I told the realtor, um, any Woody Allen fans in the room? Nobody? <laughs> okay. Who's Woody well, Allen? No, I'm just kidding. This, 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 this realtor's like a Woody Allen. He's like, he's a nerd. He's a schmuck. He's a schlemiel. He's a schlemiel and a schlemazi. <laughs> and if you speak Yiddish, you'll understand that. Or if you're from Brooklyn. So here's the deal. Um, the house is in good shape. So I hired the inspector, and I said specifically to the inspector, I'm only concerned with one thing, and that is the roof. So the day of the inspection, which was a Friday, and we had to get out of the contract on a Monday, the inspector came back and said, I need a roof. Now this is not just a minimal roof, this is a barrel tile, poker roof, you know. This is a $25,000, dollars $35,000 job. So I politely told the realtor, I'm sending you the, the report which indicates the house needs a roof. Now I do that to use it in my negotiating skills. Now what does he have to do? He has to disclose that the house needs a roof, right? So I said, unless the, the, the seller is willing to give us a significant discount for canceling the contract, I had crickets. Monday, 9 a.m., I sent a cancellation of contract. By 4.30 p.m., our contract was not canceled, and I got a $25,000 credit. So now I am the, bar, the buyer's hero. Folks, you gotta negotiate, you gotta negotiate from a position of strength and knowledge, and, and in good faith. We are in a people business. So I told Woody Allen, he's, he, he goes, would, would they take $10,000? I said, I felt like saying, schmuck, what do you not understand? It needs to, I, and I said very politely, I said, with all due respect, I told you our position. Um, if you want to come back with a real number, but otherwise, please have the, you know, the, con the contract cancellation executed. We've got 25 grand. Everybody's happy. Yeah. And on my end, uh, I'm waiting to use an inspection. If you buy a house for 100 and sell it for 100 and not making any money, you can go back and get an inspection for get an inspection. And if it's not, too offensive and the seller will give you an inspection, you can create some spread and make some more profit that way. I mean, how many wholesalers do that? Like, all of them. Right. Can I bring up our deal? Okay. We have a deal that's going south right now. Oh. Badly. All right? Okay. Everybody's got their deposit up. The buyer buying the house, zero inspection, never been in, right? Never this is the in. ultimate buyer, the end buyer? The end buyer. Yeah. The, the B2C. The B2C buyer, I've never been. I don't know if you've been in, but the B2C, he's the, he's the A to B. And then the buyer, the seller, and then I sold it to somebody else. Never been in the house. Day before closing, they decide to go see the house. House is a foundation settling problem. Day of closing. Day of closing, sorry, that was a day before. Day of closing, got a foundation settling problem. What do you do? Get the deposit, super damages, super specific warrants. Who's suing who? Is he suing the Well, in this situation, are you prepared to close? It's got a foundation problem. It's a disaster. Did you I think you lose the house? I think you lose your deposit. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so now it's, it's further complicated. This, yeah, it's a foundation okay. problem. That's why I brought it up. One second. So lose now. It. Not just don't I like the paint in the house. Did you know that there was a foundation problem when you put it under contract? No. 
you did not. Does that come into a disclosure yes. thing? So there was a disclosure. You need to get out of Now, again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not going to render legal right. advice. Sure. But the bottom line is if that was never disclosed and you found out about it in the 11th hour, you just need to get out of the contract and let everybody go away because it is going south. And I will tell you, foundation problems, folks, are the things that scare me most. And I've been there, done that. And it's not fun. Because imagine if your actual rehab is only 20, 25 grand, but your foundation costs are going to be that, but, and then some. And if your house is only worth 250, 300, where's your profit? This is a $100,000 house in Collier City. The rehab was 20 to 25. I think that's what it takes to do 20 to 25. Run! Yeah. Rehab now is Run! 40. So, what I'm saying, I'm asking, I'm asking you guys. Does he have recourse to get his money back because of the foundation? Absolutely. It wasn't this close. You squeeze him, send him a, send him a lawyer's letter right away. Send him a lawyer's letter. Sorry. Yeah. Because they'll cave as soon as I they get I thought about it this letter. afternoon, a got distracted strong... again, but came right back here. I'm like, was, was the property listed? Yes. Yes. Oh, so you can go on to the wait, agent. Did the realtor disclose? You go off to the agent. Wait, for you to grab disclose? that MLS printout, and there's probably no disclosure on the MLS printout. But what if and they didn't know? A realtor didn't know a latent defect? Why not? Uh, I would, I would say not. you just get your money back and move on. Yeah, I mean, you'll have two options. Either you're going to cancel and they'll cancel it, or and buyer's going to lose their deposit. You'll take the deposit and then they'll take your deposit. Oh, and the, problem, the problem here is the seller is all over you like white on rice to get the deposit back. And the, the, the our buyer, the B2C buyer, has got the money with you and now, I would be they're never going to release it. They're just going to keep it there. I would not give them. the B2C buyer back money. You would not. Not yet. I wouldn't either. Until no, you get your money. They, back. and here's the deal. I will tell you, um, in, in thousands of deals, there may have been one or two that I didn't see on the inside, but at the very least, I did a drive-by. It's always buyer beware. The old Latin saying, caveat emptor. It's not his fault or his fault that the end buyer didn't see it. It's the buyer's fault. Now, that's the cost of doing business, folks. I would not be giving that end buyer their money unless you I get me. Oh, it's not going to happen. That's it, Jimmy. Is this guy going to see it? Is that, it's not. So what do we know? It's the second deal he's done. He flips it to somebody else. But no, I'm not. There's no, no way he's going to get luck. his money back. But so he's saying, not going to. Yeah. You want to go see the house or you're going to buy it side of seat? He's like, you can probably go buy a side of seat. Just put it up in the bottom? Cool. Okay. Good. Good. See ya. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think there's a lot of variables. How much the deposit? How much is the profit spread? Five. The failure to, to disclose. You got to like really ask yourself if it's worth it. Like having a whole like huge issue. Yeah, no, well, you've got you've got a seller and a realtor raising fuss, right? You've got a seller and a realtor raising a big stink. Okay. The other thing is, really stink. And this is really important. You're prepared to file a threat complaint against that realtor for non-disclosure. So you have an attorney's letter to the seller. And you have a potential threat complaint to the to the listing realtor. Get a copy of that MLS printout before they change it, where there's no disclosure of foundation problems. The list of the letter is going to cost less than a deposit loss. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm a big fan of uh, the, the the Sun Tzu Art of War principles. So yes. It's basically, if you're going to start a war, you have to be ready to do battle. So. It might be better sometimes to just back off because if you're going to go the whole way of crack and everything else, you can turn into a whole huge can of worms, and you you really got to like think about the whole big picture of it because sometimes your best offense is to retreat. You know that's what I think, uh, even and, though you don't really I'll, want to. But I will agree with you. Yeah. Be, here's the deal. First of all, what's your level of paranoia when you're doing certain things? Secondly, are you ready to lit litigate? Now, I'll just tell you, um, and I'm, I will guarantee everybody at this table will agree with me, you're not always going to win. If you're doing a lot of business, you can either break even here and there or you can lose here and there. Would you agree, gentlemen? Yeah. That's reality. Again, I deal only in reality. I've litigated. And what Lex says is very true. And if they're not going to do it like gentlemen, for lack of a better term, then you can start the war 
But if you hit with just an attorney's letter and a fret complaint, they'll know you're serious. They really will. And I think the logical resource is if everybody would just get the deposit back and move on, and no one has to create a big you know, litigation, it's probably better for, for the seller and the buyer and the end buyer you know, across the board. The problem is though, now they're gonna have to disclose. That's the case. Yep. The All listing right, so, will have to disclose. Yeah. Where I'm not sure how technical it is, whether if they didn't know about it, did they have a duty to disclose if he didn't know it existed? Now they know. I'm saying prior to those. So they get to the seller's disclosure? And now it comes, now the, you know, and if they do disclose it, the actual value of the house plummets. And by the way, they will pay 98 for it. There is, you know. All right, so we're learning some good stuff here tonight, right? Because these are some good, like, uh, real life scenarios. So here's a question give an example of your first phone call with a distressed owner, or if an owner calls you. So my first phone call with an owner, I didn't know it was a phone call uh, with a distressed seller. So basically, um, both Kevin and uh, David know the guy that trained me in real estate, Ben. And uh, I drove around for about five or six months looking for deals, knocking on doors. I wasn't getting very far. And I put an ad in the paper, and uh, a couple of weeks went by, I got a few phone calls, and then I renewed the ad for another 14 days in the Sun Sentinel, and I got a call from a guy, and he said, did you buy houses? And I was kind of taken aback, because I was sitting at Starbucks, and I answered my cell phone, and I said, yeah, we buy houses. And he says, well, I've got three houses under contract, and I've got $10,000 deposit up. My money's already hard and I will sell it to you, I'll give them to you, if you just give me my 10,000 back. And I wasn't really sure, I wasn't really comprehending what it was that he was saying, but my gut instinct was that this looked like it could be a deal. So I hung up the phone and I called Dan and I said, I think I got a deal. And he said, tell me the story. So I repeated the story, he said, oh, this is definitely a deal. I said to him, I haven't even given you the addresses or the prices yet, he says, it doesn't matter, it's a deal. And it was. It was basically three houses from one seller, and it was my first deal in the business. And I was a bird dog in that deal, so I just got paid a finder's fee of 5000 per house, but it was a good way to get started. And I got another question here from someone saying, where to find a mentor for wholesaling, or should I be a bird dog? So I would recommend, I always recommend to everyone, the best way to start out is the way I did. Find deals for other people, because you're not risking any cash, you're not risking any money. When you learn how to do that, and you bring a deal to someone that wholesales it a few times, three, four, five times, you start getting the hang of it, then you can start progressing out to you know, wholesaling yourself, and then moving to fix and flips, and, and, and so forth. Um, all right, folks, so basically, well, does anybody have any more questions? Because we're all out of question cards over here. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, let's go this way first. So I want to add to what Lex is just saying. You know, if you're just starting out, a uh, show of hands in the room, who's just starting has not done a deal yet? And who's tran all right, go ahead, okay. Who's transitioning from a full-time job? Um, full-time job, are you getting out of it? I actually just let go, so I'm like really- All right, well, come on over. I'm going to give you something. Oh, all right, so here's uh, the law of the garbage truck. Oh, uh, you know, my friend David J. Follet, so enjoy that. Get rid of the garbage if you have any. Um, so, when you're just starting out, what Lex was saying, and I'll add to it, is be a bird dog. Don't worry about the money. A lot of people are hungry. I don't have that kind of money. There is so much money out there. I mean, I'd love to loan you money if you're going to retail a property or make it into a rental. Um, but, you know, whether you call one of us, just we can, if it's a deal, we will guide you through it and you will profit if it's a deal to be had. On uh, Lex's first call, and you know, I know Ben, and Ben's a terrific guy. Ben was gonna lead Lex on the right path, and it was profitable. If Lex made $15,000 for basically answering a phone call, and how much did that boost your confidence? No, it was that I was about ready to quit, like three weeks before yeah. last thing about quitting. So we wouldn't have been here tonight, probably, if it wasn't for that deal. Yeah. You never know. And you never know. So on, on, on one of the negotiations I just did, I didn't offer up a number. And I had a number in my head, and the number was over 100. And when the guy came to me below 100, I had to think, because I never want to be too eager. And my common answer to that is, I think I can work with that. Very common. I think I can work with that. Can I send you the contract? 
And I did. I'm just going to tell you another negotiation before I pass it on to Lex. Um, some of you know I'm, I'm in the uh, car hobby and I love classic cars and I, um, I it's like so addicting. It's like the house business. And anytime I get a deal, uh, I'm all over it. And I negotiate, I, I offer such ridiculous prices like they're never going to take it. And they do. So one of my, definitely one of my best, if not my best car negotiations was a guy who was referred to me by my friend John Greer, who owns Gold Coast School of Real Estate. And it's on a car I really like. I've always liked it. It's a Buick Riviera. Most of you don't even probably know about it. How many people know about a Buick Riviera? Oh, good. Okay. Now, somebody I know in Miami just flipped one for over 50. Now, I'm going to keep this car. So the guy said, well, I just had it sold and I took a deposit for 26000 And my instant response is, I can't pay you 26000 He goes, what can you pay me? I said, what's the, what's the best you can do? My seven favorite words to negotiate. He goes, I'll give it to you for nineteen. Already, I just dropped $7,000 on a phone call. I said, look, I can't give you nineteen. I certainly don't want to insult you. I'm a real buyer. And he was in St. Cloud, Florida, in the center of the state. So let me know, you know, if you get a little more eager. Don't use the word desperate, eager. Psychology, psychology of the sale. Two weeks, two weeks later, he said, uh, are you still interested in the car? I said, oh, I'm interested. He said, well, I'll sell it to you for 16. I said, I can't pay you 16. P.S. <laughs> about another month. I, I was gonna, in May, I was buying myself a birthday present. I would get in the car in May. So in May, he calls me and he goes, um, are you still interested in the car? I, I put it in an auction that didn't sell. You know, in Podunk, it's not going to sell at an auction. You know, it's not Barrett Jackson or Mika. So, what's the best you can do? He goes, 12,000. We went from 26 to 12. So, you know what? Let me come up and see it. So, one Saturday morning, I wrote, drove up, and I saw the guy, I shook his hand, saw his son. He said, so show me the Chevelle that you got. I want to see your Chevelle after I look at you. I said, show me the Chevelle. Show me the Chevelle. He's all proud. Now I know he's spending money on the Chevelle. I know I'm going to leave buying this car. So long story short, I take it for a drive. I come back. I said, you know, you never want to tell somebody how bad something is. I said, look, you need some love, um, but I'll, I'll make you a deal on it. Um, and I brought cash to put put down. But before I did, I said, hey, you know, I saw Center State Bank at the end of the road. I bank with Center State Bank. Who do you bank with? What do you think you said? Center State, State Bank. I said, instant connection, right? I said, look, I'll give you a deposit, I'll give you ten thousand dollars. And I shut the front door. I just I, said, I can't take ten thousand dollars. I said, all right, listen, Mark, nice to meet you. And I walked away. And as I'm walking back to my car, he goes, I'll take ten too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm gonna argue over two hundred bucks. <laughs> I walked calmly. I peeled out twelve hundred bucks. I said, "Okay, uh, why are you the rest of the money? Why am I in the title? I'll just have the car show." Now, the moral of the story. What is, are you flipping it to me for? No, 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 no. I already rejected thirty, so I'm not going to sell it because more than likely it's going to be in the Boca Concord de Elegance next oh, year. Nice. So it's going to be a Concord quality car that I just stole. Now. What, how, did, how does this translate to houses? Every single one of you in this room, like every single one of you, Kevin, Kevin's probably seen more deals than anybody because he's constantly seeing these deals. Would you say you've seen some unreal deals, even in this economy, across your desk? Absolutely. There's your hope. Whether it's cars, whether it's houses, don't give up hope because there's going to be somebody, whether it's somebody that died, a friend of the family, let everybody know what you do and you'll get a deal. Let me tell you, those, those seven words, they saved me 200 bucks today. I know the guy quoted me yesterday, the guy quoted me to do, do some work in my house. It was $1,200. And I looked at the quote and I go, I did. I gave it a direct. You know, that's the best you can do. Instantly took $200 off. You're welcome. You're welcome. It works. You're welcome. <laughs> So as I said earlier, you know, some of the best deals are going to be these estate sales. Why? Because a lot of them are out of town, right? They're, they're, there could be heirs, siblings, they're in another state. They don't really know what the house is worth, nor do they really care. All they care about is a dollar figure. 
We're looking to make $10,000 each. So a lot of those are gonna be your large, I've seen people flip 40, 50, $60,000. I mean wholesale. The average person doesn't make 45 grand in a year. You're wholesaling a deal for 60 grand. One deal in one year, you can make 60 grand. So, you know, if you start really looking for, for the, and you have to network to find them, they're not that easy to come by, uh, but they're there. They're definitely, uh, you know, a lot of deals out there. And then the other thing I wanted to just tie into the question, we're talking about the mentors, because, you know, I, I see so many investors, because I go to all the investment clubs and I speak on, on a lot of their panels and I, I do a lot of their closings. And the biggest mistake that I have found are two, either the one that they invested 30, 40, $50,000 in that program with someone who's not even around, or they're coming to the meetings one month and then they're not here month two, month three, month four, and then maybe they'll come back again in another couple of months when they're sick and tired of being sick and tired of not making any money. And then a few more months go by. So two things, don't invest in, in a mentor that is not local to your area. Invest in someone like the three gentlemen that are here that know the local market, that can guide you, that can hold your hand and can make sure you're successful. I've worked with pretty much every one of Lex's students because I mean, I was doing deals before Lex was even doing deals. I was closing them for his mentor. So I've seen every single one of these students, Jimmy in my office, David in my office, they meet with the students in my office and I've seen them become successful. The other ones that show up at the meeting on month one and month two, they, they don't do anything. You leave here and you don't have the, the foundation in order to be able to do deals. If you want a true foundation, you're gonna to have to invest in something. You're gonna to have to either come here religiously every single month and network with people and become friends with people, or you're gonna to have to spend some money in mentoring. You're gonna to have to spend some money on some type of program that's gonna teach you what to do. It's very, very important because you're gonna leave here, you know, and the, and the hands go up every time you say, well, who saw us on Meetup and, and who's here for the first time? And there's always 15 or 20 people that are here for the first time. And then the problem is there's no second time. There's no third time. Rob, how many deals? I don't know if you want to share how many deals you've done. He's done a lot of deals. And he's here every single month at every meeting he's here. And plenty of other students of Lex's and David's and Jim's, they're here. And they're doing deals month after month after month after month. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but I don't want to see you. And the reason I like to tell you is because now we're getting into the summer. I don't want to see you leave here and then you're not going to come back in August and you're not going to come back in September, right? I don't want you here just because you found it on Meetup and you had a little spare time. If you really want to get into this business, there's so many people in this room that are doing deals every single day. They're just rocking at it. And if you want to be one of those people, you're going to have to make an investment in yourself in order to do it. But don't invest in that one where, you know, your mentor's in Utah and they're trying to teach you how to buy a 3-2 in, in Pompano Beach. And they've never bought a house in their life. Like these guys have all bought houses, own houses, own rentals, rehabs. Those are the people you want to surround yourself with, as well as the ones that are out here. There's plenty of knowledge here of people that know what they're doing. So either network or invest, but either way, deal with someone local on the ground here. Can I add to that? Sure. I'll add to that. I got into the business. How did I get into it? I went to your two three day three day boot camp in two thousand one. It was a two day boot camp, right? The other hotel, right? And, uh, and you tell them you were you were a golf pro. Yeah, I was a golf pro. Yeah, I, I wasn't making any money as a golf pro anymore. So what the heck? So I, I went to the two day boot camp, and it was a fix and flip, and fix and flip. And the first day was in the classroom, and the second day was looking at houses, and. Folks, you need to do something. At 11 o'clock on the bus trip, I bought a house. And at one o'clock, I bought a second house. <laughs> and I used hard money, okay? But, man, I was involved. I had, well, I was in, but I did something. It's not like I went to one meeting, I went to your expo and walked away. I went to your expo and said, man, this is really cool. And then called you up, went to the three-day boot camp, and rehab for your I uh, got off a of bar lot, and I like wholesale. So you figure <laughs> out what you do after a while. So, so Jim figured out the path. And I remember when Lex started the meeting, and I remember when, um, you know, listen, this is, this is a bond here at the table. We can look at each other as adversaries, but I choose to say that these are my friends first, and sometimes my friendly competitors. 
And that's all good because every single person at this table is a giver. And you know, Bob Berg wrote the best selling book, The Go Giver. And uh, I'll give you, I'll share you a story because Kevin talked about, you know, Rob. Kevin introduced me to Rob. And I'll never forget when I went to fund Rob's first deal. And, you know, he'll tell you the story. I pulled up in my Corvette and I was in and out of there in five minutes and said, I'll see you at the closing table. And he was like, What? What just happened? Are you funding my deal? And how, would you say your confidence after that deal shot up 110%? More than that. More than that. But you see, after I'll you break. I have to give him extra credit because I didn't know how to rehab. Right. And, you know, I, I got like three deals as a realtor. I was like, dude, I got enough money to rehab. And I didn't know what I was doing. And then I went to this uh, rehab, rehab, rehab. Right. Rehab. And I was like, it costs two grand to fix it. Are you kidding? Right. Walking to Home Depot, he's like, this is a toilet. It's 150 bucks. You're paying too much, they're down to 99 for the center flush job. I'll help them out with you. $99 for the center flush. You were at the boot camp, you just came back. You came back to my boot camp and I showed him at Lowe's it was $99 the for the center. The toilet market is nothing down It's in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes. You're paying too much. You're not allowed to get another 20% off from Lowe's. It's 80 bucks. Well, I'll give you that. Let me, let me just tell you. Um, Okay, well, while, while you're going to that topic, why don't you read out this question because it's right on par with that. Oh, all okay, right. Well, let me just tell you one How thing. How much is a toilet? Yeah, just read that out because it's uh, completely related. For fix and flips, what's the best way to purchase materials? You're right. Appliance to reduce cost wholesale rather than buying retail. First of all, I wanted to let you know that because this is it's a really, who asked that question? Here's your I Buy Houses t-shirt. That was good. <laughs> all right. Don't hurt right, you get your double dip. What was that? I said, don't hurt them. It's a damn t-shirt, Kevin. What are you? You're doing 10 pegs and you're worried about him getting hurt. What the pegs. hell's the matter with you, man? You need a cocktail. All right. So, first of all, I retail. I, I, there's three levels for me. There's wholesaling, there's retail, retail fixing, and there's rental. Wholesaling is, for lack of a better term, lipstick on the pig. Clean it up, paint it, put it back in the market. Okay? Full retail is you're going all out and you're going to make it nice for that new buyer. Rental, I rehab differently for rent. And people that work with me, like Yossi and Milano, they know that you do the least amount for the neighborhood, make it appropriate, make sure it's clean and cold, and you know that's it, don't rent. Um, you should all get a Home Depot and Lowe's Pro Card. Go to the Pro Desk. You will save money. Get a pro account. Well, my biggest flipper is Home Depot's biggest customer in Broward County. They spend a lot of money. And I know Home Depot's biggest customer in Palm Beach County. And they get a lot of rebates. Now, when you're first starting out, look for, I don't know if they change the address. They still have a 10% off of Lowe's. So you can take that coupon to Home Depot if you prefer Home Depot and show them the lowest coupon. If they don't honor it, they just leave the cart there and say, okay, never mind, thanks very much. I'll go to Lowe's and buy it. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Use your negotiating skills. Um, get to know the guys and the ladies at the pro desk. Now, I have for 25 years bought my appliances at Brandsmart. See Sam A in major appliances and tell him I sent you. I also go to the Brandsmart Clearance Center. For rentals, do you need to buy new appliances? The answer is absolutely not. Whether you're on Craigslist, whether you're on Facebook, by the way, the Facebook marketplace is amazing. Yeah. It is so, so, it's like one of my, I found more cars there to buy. It's also a good place to sell houses. And it's a good place to sell houses. So you, you gotta use the Facebook marketplace. By the way, I'm just interested. Who in this room is not social? Who's not on Facebook? You're not, sir? Can I ask why? Okay, what kind of, what kind of business are you? You need to get on Facebook. I want everybody to know. Uh, but that's the first time I, you know, it's usually a sprinkle. You're the only one, so things are really, it's, it, it is, look, I'm gonna also tell you something, a little off topic. Um, whether it's going to be Amazon, Amazon is now in the tiny house business. Did you know that? They're selling tiny homes. There is going to be a great real estate disruptor. Everybody at this table is an out-of-the-box 
person, as an investor, as a talent company, as a host, whatever. We are not in that box. And neither should you be. I'll tell you why. Because if you're in the box, and if you're just a conventional realtor, chances are you could be broke. You're not making necessarily money. But when the great real estate disruption comes, whether it's going to be, you know, Amazon or, or an Elon Musk type or a Jeff, you know, Bezos type, somebody's going to put a major disruption on the real estate industry. And at the end of the day, it'll still be a people business. But if you don't have a niche, you could be out of business. Liz, you have a question? Yes, I'm going to add something to what David just said, and he's oh. right, because I just came across an article from Zillow, and what they're doing to the market is unbelievable. But they're not the disruptor. You, they're in the flipping business, by the way. Well, they're they, in the just, yeah. they just, last year, they bought more than, I think it was more than 20 something million dollars worth of properties. So they're yeah. becoming gorilla. So watch out. Wait, now. Okay, real estate's a cycle, folks. When was the last recession? How long ago? 2008. And it pretty much ended in 2009. Ten years, right? We have never, in South Florida, had a ten-year cycle like this. Never happened. There is a slight correction going on right now. I'm telling you. I talked, I, I talked with a friend of mine who went to high school together. He specializes in Portland. He's said right now, the recession, the Great Recession was the worst he's ever seen it. But right now, he's sitting on a lot of million dollar listings. And you know partly because you live there, and I live there. And I said, you've got to expand outside of your market so you can make money. Um, the million dollar market, folks, is really challenged. In the Wall Street Journal, in the last, if you're not reading and knowing what's going on, you're gonna be out of business. The Miami market, Due to many, many factors, the, the high-end market, lack of Ameri Latin American dollars, is hurting. Not only in Miami Beach, but in Miami, there's a lot of condo inventory now. It's, it's really starting to hurt, and they're trying not to publicize it, but the numbers are going to be down. Conversely, I do market research, I share at every meeting. Every single month in Broward County, let's say, five cities, time after time, Fort Lauderdale, Pembroke Pines, Pompano, you know, Hollywood, the hot cities. What is driving the market? What we do, we are driving the market. And Zillow will not be the great disruptor. Because I, I, I see, a, if you ask me, people say, is there going to be a bubble? The bubble I see is all these hedge funds that have spent so much money getting a 5 or 6% return if they're lucky. I, a 5 cap is no good for me. If it's on a 10 cap minimum, I'm not interested. I'm not going to talk to you. Does everyone understand that? But these guys have to put their Wall Street money on the street. But it's going to bubble. And how is that going to affect us? It really won't. That could be an opportunity for us. I can't wait to buy it back. I can't wait right with you. Okay, question over there. What are the best types of real estate that you can do on starting? Entry level. So workforce housing. So whether you're you're gonna you wanna have rentals or you wanna have homes to flip? I wanna I would say like start at wholesale because I got okay. good. So I would start on the low end because no matter what, whether it's you know, especially Jim or Lex. If you get a good deal, they'll have a buyer for you. No problem if it's a good deal. But I always say start in the workforce housing area and stay there. That's been my bread and butter my entire career. So, you know, my, my tenants, who are my tenants? The house cleaner, the guy that works on the golf course, the electrician, the painter, the cop, um, people who will always be employed school teacher. Those are my tenants. I love single moms. Single moms pay their rent. They don't want to get thrown on the street. Am I, am I discriminating because I like single moms? That doesn't sound very good. No. Just good. <laughs> no. Listen. I happen. 
Let's clean it up, folks, okay? This is a family show. Okay? It's a matter We're on video. Yeah, fine. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I forgot about um, But you, you have to know also, you have to get to know areas. So, like, I would guarantee you, with 100% certainty, that everybody here has done deals in the, the Tri County area in every single neighborhood. I mean, in thousands of deals, I can pretty much tell you, just like Jim, I know these neighborhoods. Like, for instance, and I'm just telling you like it is, there are certain ethnicities and areas, for instance, know that the Brazilians are on Sample and, um, and Federal, know that they're also on Coconut Creek, know that they're in West Boca, know that Wilton Manors is gay, know that uh, Sunrise Golf Village that used to be Jamaican is Haitian. Am I discriminating against everybody? No. Money's green, but you got to know your neighborhoods. The only way you're going to know that is by driving them. Um, know that if, you know, I, I had a, an epiphany like two or three years ago, I'm at a business expo in West Palm Beach, and there are more Hispanic people than I've ever seen. And I'm asking, where do you live? PGA. Where are you from? Colombia. I didn't know. Weston is Weston Zuela. You have to know these neighborhoods. Take it easy, okay? You know, Little Havana. You know the, the coolest thing? Do you know why there's so many landlords in Little Havana and Hialeah? Because those people don't move. They are tenants for life. You have to know the makeup of each of these areas. Whether you're buying to, to sell, to wholesale, or to rent. Uh, Christian. Say you're looking at a house, you know, every which way you're looking at it, it's a deal. But, there's always a but. There are tax liens and city code violations associated with the property. And even after you incorporate that, along with what the seller wants for it and whatever needs to be done to rehab it, it's still a deal. Along with a wholesale experience, the strategy is the wholesale. How would you approach that? The first question would be, can you negotiate with the cities to bring those you know, liens and code violation, you know, prices down, one. And then two, when you're marketing it to an end buyer, would you have to take care of those violations first? AKA, will you pay that first, get that out of the way first before you, you, you disclose that to the buyer? Or do you put that as like an addendum in your contract saying, hey, by the way, there are these open liens and code violations and so on and so forth on the property. And you know, your spread is essentially part of your spread is going to be taking care of that before it goes to the end buy. Okay, so that's like a quadruple prompt question, but so basically uh, uh, I would say there's, there's a lot of things going on in that question. So the first thing is is that it depends on the city and the municipality because sometimes they're going to sched schedule a special magistrate hearing, but they'll only allow you to appear if you're actually the owner of the property, which means you're going to need to close on it before you can do that, and that's going to run problems when you have a lender because the attorney is not going to let the lender fund a deal. Having said that, sometimes you can pick up the phone and you can call them up and say, look, what needs to be resolved? And you could have something like an overgrown lawn that was running at 250 a day for the last three years, and you can just go and pay someone $1,000 and mow the lawn and then call them up and say, look, I took care of the lawn, can you go check on it? And then sometimes they'll say, okay, I'll waive this and I'll, I'll lower it to, and it could be $500 or it could be $5,000. It's really up to them how, how, how they are and it depends on the city, you know, so that's that part of the question. Um, so the second part of the question I would say is, is that if you're going to wholesale it, you would need to have, I wouldn't just blanket put that out on the list, you need to have a specific person in mind. So if you have a buyer that buys liens and code violations and he's maybe a GC or something, then you can call them up and say, hey, I've got a deal for you, it's a little funky, but here's the deal. And he'll go and look at it and if it works for him, he'll buy it. But I wouldn't just go and blanket put it on the list because those kind of deals can often be your biggest spreads, your biggest profit. The ones that um, you work on the longest sometimes will be your biggest home runs. So I would be looking to try and structure that to take it down as a fix and flip as opposed to just trying to wholesale it and make three or five thousand dollars on that solution. And me being just a pure wholesaler, I am not going to take care of the liens and violations. That's, I'm going to I'm going to disclose that to my end buyer, or that is, and say, hey, yes, this does have forty, fifty-five thousand dollars worth of code violations, program, grass. 
a roof permit that would never close, but the roof is put on, blah, blah, blah. But that's going to be the end buyer's problem. Now I'm going to base my buy price to the person selling it to me, you know, because I need to take it on with the $55,000 worth of liens and the open, open roof permit that was never closed, even the roof was put on. I'm going to go beat the buyer, the, beat the seller for that. And you're going to put in your contract, obviously, you know, subject to these issues. And, and I'm going to tell you, you need to be a sophisticated buyer. If you're thinking about buying houses like that, you need to be sophisticated enough to know how. Because we're dealing with one right now where we did everything we could possibly do. The buyer bought the property subject to all of these code issues, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, they, and typically what's going to happen is they're going to buy it, they're going to fix it, and then do what Lex said, go before a hearing to get it reduced. And the buyer got a call from the city attorney uh, two, two days ago, I think it was two days ago, or maybe it was on Friday, got a call from the city attorney and said, here's the deal. I'm not giving you a permit. You either pay us what we're owed or I'm foreclosing on the property. So now this sophisticated buyer needs to figure out what is his strategy with hiring an attorney and battling with the city because they basically are, are holding them hostage. Now, whether it's legal or not for her to do that, we're gonna battle this out right now but you just want to be careful because where the big spread is, it's also riskier. Just like buying at the courthouse auction, very, very risky. You need to know what you're doing. You need to be sophisticated before you get into these deals uh, because you need to be able to then come up with an exit strategy and execute on that exit strategy, not lose all of your money. So this investor is facing potentially, I, I think in this case, the, the fines were $80,000 and they said, pay us 80 grand or we're foreclosing on your property. He said, well, I just paid 45 and it's not worth 45 plus 80. I was hoping to get that 80 reduced down to maybe eight and sell it. So you just need to be careful that, that that's kind of my uh, little bit of advice is if you're a new investor, stick with wholesaling. Right, But if you have a deal like that, bring it to someone like these guys that can find a sophisticated buyer to flip it to, because it's gonna be very hard for you to structure that deal and negotiate it properly. You want someone like these guys that have done so many deals that are able to then help structure that deal to get you a buyer that will take it subject to, and once you disclose everything, you're covered. So you don't have a problem. What municipality is that? Fort Lauderdale. You're gonna see it on NBC. We're actually exposing the city attorney. We found out that, that she's a licensed realtor and we think she was passing deals to an investor. That, so she was pissed that, that it didn't go to foreclosure to her buyer, that we actually closed on it. So she got very, very angry. So yeah, we're working with NBC now to expose her. But the whole idea is that still, I have a buyer that paid 45 grand, I have a buyer that cannot pull permits, and I have a property going to foreclosure on August 21st or something. So time is of the essence to figure out what are we gonna do and work together to get it done. So we went to the mayor, we went to NBC, we went to all the city representatives and the, the, the um, uh, count, what do they call them, county commissioners. Uh, we went pretty much to everyone and we said, listen, here's the deal, this is what we think is going on. And they're trying to work on a resolution. If they don't come back with one, then we're going full force against the uh, attorney for saying, I mean, you did something wrong. Because she has a vested interest. She's emotionally tied to this deal, which tells me she was making money somewhere. So what was the track record with Fort Lauderdale before that? Fine, never had a problem, right? I've never had a problem with an investor buying a property and mitigating fines. Maybe they don't get the lien reduced as much as they had hoped, well, but if they always negotiate. If you buy the property, you fix it up. They never say, we're not even giving you a permit to fix it up. Like basically stop put, putting a halt on everything. I've never seen it done before and I've done a lot of, I don't know if you guys have, uh, like I called your one guy, it was a different scenario, uh, but I've never heard of, of a city putting a stop on it, which means that she must have been losing something. Because she's a city employee, so right? So she gets paid a salary no matter what, so she's losing something. Go so the more we dig, the deeper we dig, we found a real estate license, we're trying to connect the dots with other properties. Big. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, so you just have to do that. So again, the moral of the story is, you need to be sophisticated in this business. Call Norman Otherwise, Kent. stick to wholesaling. Norman Kent. Norman Kent. I mean, um, Bob Norman. Bob Norman. Reporter Bob Norman. Channel 10. I think that also, that, 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 that's like a really tough situation yeah. to be in, but I think that uh, finding a good foreclosure defense attorney would be like one good tool to have an arsenal. And another thing as well is, I would try and go to their supervisor and their supervisor's supervisor. I had a problem once in a deal, 
and I went all the way into the city and knocked on the mayor's door until I finally got their attention and I said, what's the problem? And I told them and then the problem went away. Yeah, the so problem they, we're having is nobody wants to go against the city because they work within the city. Right? So they're like, well, we need them on other issues. So it's going to be a, it's hard. This person has a supervisor, though. They have someone that they report to. Oh, yeah. 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 So we're working on it. But I mean, again, it just goes to just, you just have to be careful what you're doing. So for the newbies, stick to wholesaling until you can build up capital and start getting involved. Don't jump into this fix and flip super quick where you don't have the money, you don't have the experience because you're going to get burned. Pass those deals off, close a couple of deals, and then pick up uh, maybe a rehab after you've been doing this for a little bit. Also, no municipalities are tough. Like, you know, Fort Lauderdale has, can be tough sometimes. Uh, there was a case against uh, Jim Ober, uh, and it's public record, and he got really, really screwed with mitigating a fine. There's an attorney in Hollywood named Matt Habibi, and he's a good guy to help mitigate those. Matt Habibi. Um, who's interested in landlording? It's not a landlord. Sir, come on up. I'll, I'll have you. I'll give you a gift for my next meeting, and there's your free pass. Go on Facebook by then. That's all test you. All right. Um, so, like unincorporated Palm Beach County is pretty lenient, and they're pretty cool. Like I pulled the permit for windows. He came. The guy was cool. Signed off. You know, inspection passed. Um, some cities are really tough. Parkland is really tough. Boca is tough, and the permit process is really long. So if you're going to be in, you know, buy fix sell business. You know, um, that's a frustrating thing. Um, what Kevin said also, I just want to make another point. On your contracts, subject to clear, marketable, insurable title, no liens and open permits. That's such a powerful line. Subject to clear, my house if you're running down, it's unbelievable. Subject to clear, I'm giving free advice. Can you say it slower? Clear. Subject to clear, marketable, insurable title with no liens. Or open permits. Are you dying of heat yet? Or code violations? Uh, it's Christmas in July, folks. Who uh, grew up in New York and remembers Crazy Eddie? Insane. insane. Those prices are insane! And I used to work there. We used to do Christmas in July, no inspection fee. When you had hard money, no what? You had hair then. I had a Jufro back then. I'm a Hebrew. I used to have a Jufro. That's right. So no inspection fee on that. And uh, I'm out of gas and I gotta go because I'm. I'm, I'm really hungry. Okay, so um, uh, how about uh, we give uh, all of our panelists a nice round of applause. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. For sitting in the seat. And thank you guys for being here tonight. And we'll see you on the first Tuesday of next month. Thank you.